chair bounced. Uh, my name is Tiffany Krieger. I am a licensed school social worker. Um, I have worked at Mount Comfort Elementary for many years, and I recently uh, just made the switch over to community mental health, where I work at four county counseling as the director of school-based services there. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, and one of the reasons I made the switch, and one of the things I get most excited about is um, talking to teachers and staff and um, counselors and social workers about how we reach out to our students and prepare them to manage the emotional stressors that are just a natural part of life, right? Whether we have those students who've been in trauma or, or who, who haven't, but still need to develop coping skills. It's a bit of a passion of mine, so um, that is, ooh, and I'm not always very technically savvy, but we're gonna do our best here. Before we begin, this topic today is, it's a tough one. Um, you know, I say that I'm passionate about these things and I'm excited, but I know that especially suicide prevention is a very difficult topic. Um, it's very personal. A lot of us may be survivors having lost someone that we love or care about, student, client, family member. Um, some of us may have battled some of these things ourselves. And so I just wanna take a minute to acknowledge that and let you know that Self-care is the most important thing, so if at any time you feel uncomfortable or you just need to step out and take a break, please do that, take care of yourself. And know that if you learn something today or down the road that has you questioning how you handled something in the past, um, don't put that on yourself. We can do all the right things and sometimes things still don't turn out you know, the, the way we hoped. So I just wanna kind of give that little caveat before I start and then because every time I do this, I test my video and then I get there and it doesn't work. We're gonna switch over to YouTube. I'm gonna start with a video from Kevin Hines. Has anybody here ever heard of Kevin Hines? Okay. He jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And he now goes around and speaks. I was fortunate enough to see him twice, actually, um, this past fall. And he's just such an inspiration. It has such a message of hope. I kinda wanna start with him. We have lost far too many lives traveling the path to this day. Since 1937, over 2,000 people have died at the Golden Gate Bridge. I feel lucky to be alive every single day. Of the thousands that have died off the Golden Gate Bridge, I am of the 1% who have survived. So I was born on drugs and premature. And then I bounced around from home to home. Nobody wanted to keep me because I was sick. And I got lucky. I landed in the home of Patrick and Deborah Hines. I had a great childhood. I thought growing up that everything's gonna be great. And then at 17, it, it all came crashing down. If you can imagine feeling that everyone around you is out to get you, trying to hurt you, and trying to kill you. And you believe that to be the truth. From the extreme paranoia, I exhibited symptoms of mania. From the mania came the hallucinations, both auditory and visual. And so with that and the bipolar disorder, I just was spiraling out of control. I vividly remember writing my suicide note. People don't get it. Like, I, I thought I was a burden to everyone who loved me. Because that's what my brain told me, because that's how powerful your brain is. I got off the bus. I walked slowly down the walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, people rode by me, drove by me, walked by me, and a woman approached me, and she said, will you take my picture? She said thanks, and she walked away. It was that moment I just said, nobody cares. The reality was that everybody cared. I just couldn't see it. I ran forward, and using my two hands, I catapulted myself into free fall. What I'm about to say is the exact same thing that 19 Golden Gate Bridge jump survivors have also said. The millisecond my hands left the rail, it was an instant regret. And I remember thinking, no one's gonna know that I didn't wanna die. In four seconds I fell, 75 miles an hour, 25 stories, and I hit the water. Uh, I was in the most physical pain I had ever experienced. I have ever experienced. 
The Coast Guard was amazing. Uh, he was just so freaked out that I was alive that he just dove in and brought me on board. The guy said, do you know how many people we pull out of this water that are already dead? And I said, no, and I don't want to know. The guy put his hand on my forehead and said, kid, you're a miracle. My father took one step into the hospital room, and I looked up at him, and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. And he said, no, Kevin, I'm sorry. And if you think about it, both of our immediate reactions were guilt, guilt that didn't belong to either of us. And even though I didn't die, I caused people a great deal of grief and pain. Just the day of my attempt still sits within them today. I asked my father if he still feared my death by suicide. He said, every time the phone goes off, his first inclination is Kevin alive. I had that impact on my dad. So after the jump, uh, the road to recovery was pretty long. I had seven psych ward stays in the next 11 years. I, I still have all the symptoms I ever had. Mania, depression, psychosis, hallucinations, all that's still there. I just know how to cope with it and I know how to beat it. I built a support network over these years of treatment so that I wouldn't be fighting this alone. So like, it's okay not to be okay. It's not okay not to ask for someone to back you up. To the families who, who live with the loss or losses of loved ones, they didn't do that to hurt you or destroy your life. They, they took their lives because they were struggling and in a great deal of emotional and mental pain. Suicide, mental illness, and addiction are the only diseases that we blame the person for perpetually. But people die from suicide just like they die from any other organ diseased. Today, no matter the pain I'm in, no matter the struggles I experience, I do believe that life is the greatest gift we've ever been given. And if you're suffering mentally, don't wait like I did sitting in denial for so long. Because recovery happens, I'm living proof. I think he says so much better than I can say what it's like to feel that pain and what it's like to have hope and survive. He speaks to a couple things that I think are relevant for all of us. Um, he, the language he uses, you know, he talks about um, shifting away from that blaming language. So we try to steer clear of saying someone committed suicide, but they died by suicide, right? Um, and it's kind of a shift in a thought, it's a shift in language, and it's taking that blame off the person and recognizing that there was something going on there. Um, he speaks to the warning signs and risk factors. He says, you know, people don't understand, I truly felt like I was a burden. He said, I felt like no one cared, the reality is everyone did, but that is how he felt. So we hear people say that sometimes. I feel like a burden to everyone around me. I don't want to go on. Those are true warning signs. He talks about those risk factors. Um, you know, he said he was born on drugs. He bounced around from home to home early on. So when we talk about adverse childhood experiences, those are some of our big ones, right? And, and having those adverse childhood experiences, and there's some of that data in the um, handout that I gave you that makes us more susceptible to mental illness and, and possibly even suicidal ideation and, and attempts. Um, he talks about mental illness. He talks about bipolar and he had hallucinations. I think he has, um, continues to have um, uh, auditory and visual. And he speaks about when he presents, he talks about how he was in high school and that happened. And that's typical onset of most mental illnesses between that 14 and 24, I think, it's on your thing too. But it's when you guys have these kids, right? It's in high school. And the usual or the typical um, difference from onset to receiving treatment is about eight to 10 years. So you guys have these kids as they're starting to develop these symptoms and maybe they aren't quite yet getting the, the services that they need. And so that's important to know and, and to consider when we see changes in behaviors. But he talks about that and, and you know, he, when he spoke um, and I saw him, he said that he, he didn't, he's like, I can't tell people that. I can't go to my dad and be like, dad, I see this guy in the back of the room. I know he's not there. He was embarrassed. So he kind of speaks to breaking that stigma, making it common language. Let's talk about what's going on. He said, it's okay to not be okay. It's not okay to not ask for help, right? So that's what we want to kind of build into the culture of our schools. And I can hear that just in being here for a few minutes that you guys are already asking your students. You have community time. I think that's amazing. Um, and he gives a message of hope. He says, you know, if anything, 
I'm here to tell you it can be okay and it's hard. And he goes, he went in and out of inpatient stays and outpatient. He's been through all of this and he's still here today. And he told us too, when he came and spoke, he said, I know that I will want to die by suicide again. I will have those thoughts, but I know what to do. And if that means inpatient, that's what I do. So it's about giving, them, giving people the hope and the tools to overcome what's going on with them. Um, just kind of some prevalence for Indiana. Suicide was the second leading cause of death for Indiana children and teens in 2015. When we look at some more stats there, um, Indiana high school students who seriously considered attempting suicide was close to 20%. And I think that was third, um, third in the nation, third highest in the nation. Um, all of these are above the national average. 17.1 uh, made a suicide plan, 9.8 actually attempted, and close to four had an attempt that was so severe it needed to be treated by a doctor or nurse. So if we think about that prevalence in our classrooms, if you have a classroom with 30 kids, you're saying you know, almost six of them have seriously considered an attempt. All right, so these are just listed. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but um, kind of learning the risk factors is important. And I'm gonna break it down into signs of emotional distress that make more sense for the classroom in just a minute. But I wanted to at least put these up here. So we know that risk factors of suicidal ideations or suicidal attempts um, are vast, there are many. I kind of spoke to that history of trauma and abuse, the ACEs, have you guys, do you guys know um, the ACEs study? Some of you, maybe. Um, so if you haven't looked into that, look at that and you can learn how that um, affects not only our mental health, but our physical health. And um, so mental illness, particularly mood disorders, schizophrenia, anxiety, um, alcohol substance use disorders, hopelessness, aggressive tendencies. I am gonna kind of read a few of them, let me see. Um, previous suicide attempt, family history, recent loss, those types of things. So those are sort of your basic risk factors. Like I said, I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna break that down so it makes more sense because this big old list is, is tough to think about how we apply that to the classroom, right? Same thing with warning signs. Um, he kind of spoke about saying, I feel like a burden. I felt like a burden to everyone, I truly did. When we hear that kind of talk, I think it's easy for us to say, yeah, you're not, come on. Um, but we need to start listening. Are there other things going on? Um, wh what else is happening with this kiddo? What else is happening with this person, this friend? Talking about wanting to die or to kill themselves. So my background is elementary school, and you would sometimes hear kiddos, you know, I would hear kiddos in the middle of a aggressive kind of meltdown say, you know, I just want to die, why don't you kill me? Um, and they would do it every time. And it got to the point where I think I became a little bit hardened to it, she says it every time. Um, and I don't even know what brought me back in, but I, well, I can tell you, it was a student who then, she was a fourth grader, she had a lot going on, she would say this every time, and then I got her iPad and she was searching how kids can get guns, how kids can get a hold of guns. And I thought, oh my gosh, um, while I have reported this to parents every time, and I have done safety plans and I've done all that, I'm not gonna stop. We're gonna keep offering that support. We're gonna take it seriously every time. So talking about feeling hopeless or having no reason to live, talk about the burden, um, acting anxious or agitated, maybe that's abnormal for them, see this change in behavior, um, withdrawn isolation, and showing rage, talking about seeking revenge. I'm talking really fast, I'm gonna tell you guys, I the bulk of this presentation I usually do in two hours, but I've done it in a half an hour and that's what I'm aiming for for you today. So stop me at any time if I get too fast. All right, so now the meat of it. So what do we do as educators, right? Well, there's two different phases we're gonna talk about. How we intervene when someone does come to us with suicidal ideation, and then before that, how we prevent, how we create a school culture that um, is, has practices of well-being and, and self-care embedded into, into our day-to-day. -day. Um, when we're talking about interve intervention, we are going to look for five signs. So all those big signs and risk factors that I just showed you, there is a huge campaign nationally, um, the Campaign to Change Direction, and it is about breaking the stigma of mental health. And we at Four County have made a commitment to be a part of this, so we go out and we talk to people and we say, here are the five signs of emotional distress. And in a little bit, we're gonna talk about five um, ways to have emotional well-being. 
but it kind of breaks it down and it says, hey, what do I look for? You give me these big, huge lists, it's overwhelming. So they say, look for personality changes, recent agitation, withdraw, poor self-care, and hopelessness, okay? So I'm gonna do it again, Personal, personality change. So that can be from being sort of quiet and withdrawn to all of a sudden overly um, manic, hyperactive, big change like that. And it can be the other way, pretty happy most of the time and all of a sudden just withdrawn and angry. But something that changes, some big shift. Um, agitated, we know what that looks like. Can be irritated, withdrawn, you know, not participating in class, not engaging with friends anymore, family, avoiding, things like that. Uh, poor self-care and hopelessness. I know some of those are just signs of teenagers. I know that, but we wanna kind of, if we notice it, that's a sign. You know, let's talk to this kiddo and see if there is something else going on. So, what do we do? We start to notice signs. We reach out and we ask, hey, are you okay? What's going on? Has something changed? One of the things that Kevin Hines um, talks about in his experience is that he got on a bus to go to Golden Gate Bridge that day and he told himself, if anyone here says to me, are you okay? Can I do anything to help you? I won't go through with it because then I know someone cares. And he talks about this, he got on the bus and he was sobbing. He's a 19 year old kid just sobbing on the bus with a bunch of tourists getting ready to go see the Golden Gate Bridge and he said um, only one man even sort of acknowledged that something was happening and it was the man sitting next to him and he kind of just moved away from him and nudged the guy on the other side and was like, what's up with this guy? And then they all got off the bus. And then he gets onto the bridge and you pass all the people and he said he was crying, he was clearly distraught and he spoke about it in that quick clip that the only person who approached him was a woman who said, hey, will you take my picture? And he kind of jokes about it, he said, I thought it was kind of clear I was having a moment here, but you know, we were focused, she was focused on being there and, and taking in the sights and he took the picture and, and then he jumped. Um, it's not always easy. I think it's easier with our students to stop and say, are you okay? I'll tell you the week after I saw Kevin Hines, I was um, at Edinburgh Outlets and I was shopping and there was a woman and she was sitting outside the dressing room and she was sobbing. And I was like, oh no, this is like a test. What am I supposed to do? Um, and I walked away, and then I went back, and she was still crying. I probably made it very awkward. I walked away again, and I came back, <laughs> and I, I was like, are you okay? And she said yes, and you know, she's like, oh, I'm fine. It's, it's something with her daughter, um, and I left. I don't know if that was the right thing to do, but I felt better, so I don't know. I at least reached out. I doubt it made a difference that day, I don't know, <laughs> but I just wanted to shift my thinking and start that practice you know, looking at the people around us, engaging with the people around us. Can we do anything? I don't know. But that's something that just stuck with me. Um, the harder questions to ask that we should ask. Have you been considering suicide? It is a myth that talking about suicide puts it in people's heads. If they're thinking about it, they're almost relieved that someone asks. You say, hey, have you been considering suicide? Or have you wished you would go to sleep and never wake up? So those are hard questions to ask. Um, we ask them in every session. Every kiddo that comes in, I say, hey, since I saw you last, have you ever wished you would go to sleep and not wake up? No, okay, just checking. <laughs> um, but it's hard, it's hard to do. I've, I've been doing this work for a decade and I still stumble over the words. I still stumble over it every time. Have you been considering suicide? Have you wanted to go to sleep and never wake up? So I'm talking really fast, so I'm gonna take a deep breath and I'm gonna first ask you guys, is anybody comfortable asking someone that today? Is anybody like, that's easy for me to ask? A couple of you, yeah, our counselors probably a few. Yeah, good, I'm still not super comfortable with it. Um, but it's important, so I just wanna practice saying the words out loud and I know it seems silly. So talk to your neighbor, figure out the language that works best for you. Say, have you been considering suicide? or have you wished you would go to sleep and never wake up? So take a minute, talk to each other. I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> if they say yes, they can come talk to me later. <laughs>
All right. <laughs> Again, if anybody did feel like they are, Sam or I are happy to walk you through the next steps. But just kind of getting used to saying those words, knowing that it is okay to ask. It doesn't put the ideas in their heads. You guys are, I'm sure, familiar with 13 Reasons Why and know that season two is coming out. We know after that was shown on Netflix, there is an increase on Google searches for how to commit suicide. Um, it increased by about 26%. Um, but it also, there was also an increase in seeking resources. So um, that stuff is out there. These kids are seeing it. Yep. Yeah, that's, I'm surprised. I think that's great. I think that's great. Thank you. So yeah, we know, um, we know that they are being exposed to these kinds of things out there in social media, on Netflix. There's the, the song, and it's the, I should know the name of it. It's the um, Suicide Hotline. You guys know the song? You're not going to make me sing it. Um, you know, and it was a coworker of mine. She had an 11, her son is 11. She was in the car and he was like, do you know what this song is, mom? And she's like, I, I hadn't even been listening. And he's like, it's the suicide hotline going across the, the radio there. And she's like, oh my gosh, my 11 year old knew this. I didn't know it. And she's the director of clinic services. Like it's, <laughs> you know, they, they know stuff, they hear stuff, they see stuff. They're, um, they're exposed to it. So we will help if we ask someone. Did someone tell? Okay. Um, so what do we do if they say yes? Yes, I have been. Or, or you suspect, yes, I think something is going on. We're gonna, we aren't going to say, no, 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 don't do that. We're going to say, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Acknowledge their feelings, right? You guys do that every day. Thank you for sharing that with me. I'm here for you. Let's make a plan. What are we going to do? And then we can go get help together. So you can go to your counselors. If you guys have people that you go to, I'm sure you guys have um, sort of a process. Uh, at Four County, if someone comes to us, we do what we call an emergency service. So if anybody comes into our building or calls us and says, hey, I have a kid here who's um, contemplating suicide, we say, okay, bring them in. We're going to do an assessment. We're going to staff it with a doctor and either have them leave with a safety plan, which would include uh, future intervention, or we're going to, our doctor might recommend an inpatient stay, and then we are going to get them there safely and then have a plan for afterwards. So, and um, that's something we had kind of talked about, I've talked and heard different people talk about, is what do we do when they come back from school? I would encourage you to um, reach out to, we well, would have to get the permission from the parents, but hopefully the hospital from where they are coming. Riley has a great system for a transition back to school where they talk with the counselors. They call and they say, hey, this person has been here for a week, two weeks. We're getting ready to transition them back. Here's what we've talked about. Here's who they've identified as their safe person. Um, you know, can we kind of have a meeting about that before they get back into the school? Because sometimes we don't even know. You know, they've been gone for two weeks. We didn't know where they were. And there's HIPAA violations and all types of things. But if we can work with our students' parents and say, hey, we want to continue the help. We want to continue the services here. What can we do? Then we can collaborate, get some um, release of information things signed, and, and work together to make that plan. So we know what to do if this child continues to have struggles. So that's kind of our intervention piece. And I told you there are another five. I'm going to go back to our, does anybody remember our five signs of emotional distress? Yell them out. Tell me one. I know they're hard to read. Agitated. Personality change. Withdraw. Hopeless. And poor self-care. Yep. So that's what we're looking for. For our, I keep saying kiddos, I'm elementary. For our students who have signs of emotional distress. So what do we do? And again, I'm so excited to hear you guys talking about the things that you are already doing. And it sounds like you're already doing some of this. So what do we do to promote emotional well-being in our classrooms and with our kids? To teach them the skills, 
so that when they are faced with something tough, they know what to do, they know where to go. So healthy habits of emotional well-being include taking care of yourself, eating well, getting good sleep, um, things like that, checking in. So having a person, whether it's a strong friendship or, or an adult um, that you know you can go to, you know, your family members, someone that you know you can go to, your support system, who is that? For some of the students, it might be you. It might only be you. Um, engage. Have something that you can engage in and um, relationships that you guys have things that you can go out and do together, right? Keep your mind healthy and moving. Relax, be active, meditate, garden dance. And then know the five signs of emotional well-being and the five signs of emotional distress. So I want you guys to think about yourselves as well. So what do we do for self-care? Are we doing that? Because if we aren't, are we able to come to school every day and really give our students our best? You know, I love the saying, you can't pour from an empty cup. What you guys do is a high burnout rate, right? So what do we do for self-care? You don't really have to answer that. I just want you to kind of think about it. And if it's watching some silly TV show, or maybe not silly, um, do you do it while you're not grading papers? Are you able to completely detach and take care of yourself? Bubble bath, run, I don't know. So I want you to think about that for yourselves. And then let's talk about what it looks like in the classroom. So taking care. It's just promoting that healthy eating, that sleeping well, the things that maybe you do, right? Those healthy habits. The check-in. Have you guys heard of the two by 10 before? Yeah, some of you. Okay, so if you haven't, a two by 10 strategy is choosing a student, your most difficult student. Picture them, I know you have one. Okay, so for two minutes a day, for 10 consecutive school days, just let them talk about what they wanna talk about. Hey, I just wanna see how you're doing. What's going on? Tell me about the things that you like. Two minutes a day for 10 days. Because we know that building a solid foundation, a solid relationship, making that emotional connection, right, is what is going to create an environment that allows our students to be successful. I have my favorite success story of two by 10 is a student that I had from, he came to our school and he was in third grade. I saw him in my office every single day in third grade, in fourth grade, and the start of the fifth grade year. Um, he struggled, he struggled to get his homework done, he was disrespectful, he and I got along okay, but in the classroom he was disrespectful, he always hated his teachers, always hated his homework, everything. And his fifth grade teacher, um, after some tough times with him, she was like, I'm gonna give this a try, I'm gonna try it. And she did, and he was, by the end of fifth grade, he was completely like phased out of my office. I would still go see him, because I kind of missed him, but he, they created a really strong relationship. He did better in school. He was doing better in his, he had wraparound services. I mean, he had all kinds of team members that would come into every IEP meeting, all these things. And there were hu it was a huge shift. Now, I'm sure that wasn't the only thing that was going on, but it was a huge difference maker in that classroom. And it's so simple. Two by 10, so try it. Even if you're like, I, there's no way, Tiffany, that's ridiculous, it's sugary and Pollyanna-ish, it might be, try it. Two minutes a day for 10 days. And so then that kind of goes to that engagement piece where we're building that relationship and we are gonna be these students, be these, is that right? <laughs> we are these students' champions. You know, we're the ones who can support them, lift them up, encourage them to be the best they can be. And, and sometimes that means giving guidelines, right? I'm not saying go out there and let them get away with things like that, but just having the structure, predictability, and also being able to depend on you and know that they can come to you, that you are a person that if they start to have these, these suicidal thoughts or, or any kind of depression, anxiety, any symptoms um, of mental illness, that they have a person they can reach out to and talk to, and you can be that person. And then knowing the five signs of emotional distress, which you guys have already done. Um, and then I want to talk about the relax piece real quick. Uh, focused attention practice is something that we integrated um, at our school, and we did it school-wide. And it's just daily breathing practice. 
So when I, gosh, I think it was my fifth or sixth year, and we were just seeing behaviors escalate. We were seeing all kinds of, um, we were definitely an increase in our students identified with ED. Um, we then took on the classroom, the, oh, words escape me. We had a behavioral classroom. Uh, support classroom in our school for the district and we were seeing escalation. We we're seeing our principal was punched in the face. The gun was taken from our safety resource officer. It was, um, you know, it just was getting rough. We're like, what are we going to do? I went and I saw Dr. Lori Desitals. Have you guys heard of her, seen her? Educational neuroscience. She's amazing. I think she's wonderful. Um, and she just absolutely inspired me to really focus on this relationship piece and this emotional regulation. And she said, it takes 90 seconds to change the to change the brain. 90 seconds to get us from that angry place to calm. Sometimes it takes a little bit more. But we can change things that quickly. So she encouraged trying what she called focused attention practice. And it's just guided breathing activities. So I went to my principal and I said, all right, I know it seems kind of silly, but I'd really like to give it a try. She was like, you know, pitch it to the teachers at the next staff meeting. If everybody's on board, we'll give it a try. Well, everyone was like, well, we'll try anything. Let's do it. So I went to all the classrooms and I pre-taught it. And this is K through five. So we did um, circle breathing is what we started with. So I took a little glitter jar and you can, this activity online, it's called Just Breathe, um, where kindergartners explain how it works in the brain. So you take this glitter jar and you show them what happens to your brain when you're angry, when you're sad, when you have these big emotions, right? And how do we calm it? We breathe or we have meaningful movement. So I pre-taught this skill and then every morning in the morning news, I would um, lead a 90 second, it became longer, um, focused attention practice. And we saw a decrease in aggressive behaviors from that were through our office referrals is how we documented it. We were asked to present at the Indiana, Indian, Indiana Principal Leadership Institute. And um, so we were like, oh, let's see if our data even reflects that this has been working. And we pulled it and we had gone from, in our first nine weeks, we had close to 60 instances of aggressive behavior through office referrals. And in our third nine weeks, because we went in April, so we just went from our third nine weeks, we had fewer than 10. And truly we had done two by 10, so we said before you send an office referral, unless it's something huge, like punching the principal, um, try the two by 10 before you do an office referral. And then we did the focused attention practice and we did calming corners in the classroom. So um, if you'll humor me for a minute, I'll just show you what the circle breathing is. And I would encourage you to kind of look it up. There's tons of resources out there and I'm happy to send you some that we would do it in the classroom at the beginning of the day, do it after recess, do it before testing, all those kinds of things. So, all right, so sit up nice and tall. Kind of try to relax. Have both feet on the ground and relax your hands. Either, well, I usually say either on your lap or on the desk in front of you, so we'll say on your lap. <laughs> and then, so I'll model it for you and then we'll close our eyes. So, as we breathe in, we're going to draw or imagine the up part of a circle. And as we exhale, we bring it back around. So if you're comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. If you're not, just remain kind of calm and quiet. Breathe in and out. Imagine drawing your circle up. Exhale and bring it down. In and out. In and out. And then just one more time. In and out. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. All right. Was that awkward? <laughs> A little bit? I'm, I've gotten used to it. But the first time I do it everywhere, it definitely feels awkward. And I would sit, my kids would laugh, because they're like, Mrs. Krieger, you're telling us to watch you, but you tell us to close your eyes. I'm like, oh, valid point. So we did some different exercises. We would breathe in a color of peace and breathe out a color of negativity. Um, and the kids would turn, they would start using it. And some of my kids 
well, their parents would reach out and they'd say, oh my gosh, I have to thank you. We had, you know, there are all the tornadoes and storms. And they said, um, we were in the basement and this mom was like, I was kind of panicking. And, um, and Ellie said, mom, it's okay. Circle breathe. And she taught it to her. And I thought that was really sweet. And this was a student who, you know, we implemented that thinking about our high need students. But this was a student who I only knew her name because her mom was the PTO president. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a lot of interaction with her as the school social worker. So she was, she was just really pleased that they were able to um, kind of develop those coping skills that are going to kind of set them up for, for handling the inevitable stress that will come their way. So that's just something that I tried. I would encourage you to sort of look into that and see if there's anything you would like to try or be willing to try in your classroom. And then, how are we on time? Oh, all right. So we'll do, have you guys seen the Be a Champion? <laughs> I have spent my entire life either at the schoolhouse, on the way to the schoolhouse, <laughs> or talking about what happens in the schoolhouse. <laughs> Both my parents were educators. My maternal grandparents were educators. And for the past 40 years, I've done the same thing. And so needless to say, over those years, I've had a chance to look at education reform from a lot of perspectives. Some of those reforms have been good. Some of them have been not so good. And we know why kids drop out. We know why kids don't learn. It's either poverty, low attendance, negative peer influences. We know why. But one of the things that we never discuss or we rarely discuss is the value and importance of human connection, relationships. James Comer says that no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. George Washington Carver says all learning is understanding relationships. Everyone in this room has been affected by a teacher or an adult. For years, I have watched people teach. I have looked at the best and I've looked at some of the worst. A colleague said to me one time, they don't pay me to like the kids. They pay me to teach a lesson. The kids should learn it. I should teach it. They should learn it. Case closed. Well, I said to her, you know, kids don't learn from people they don't like. <laughs> she said, that's just a bunch of hooey. And I said to her, well, your year is going to be long and arduous, dear. Needless to say, it was. Some people think that you can either have it in you to build a relationship or you don't. I think Stephen Covey had the right idea. He said you ought to just throw in a few simple things, like seeking first to understand as opposed to being understood. Simple things like apologizing. You ever thought about that? Tell a kid you're sorry, they're in shock. I taught a lesson once on ratios. I'm not real good with math, but I was working on it. <laughs> and I got back and looked at that teacher edition. I taught the whole lesson wrong. <laughs> so I came back to class the next day and I said, look guys, I need to apologize. I taught the whole lesson wrong. I'm so sorry. They said, that's okay, Ms. Pearson. You were so excited. We just let you go. <laughs> I have had classes that were so low, so academically deficient that I cried. I wondered, how am I going to take this group in nine months from where they are to where they need to be? And it was difficult. It was, it was awfully hard. How do I raise the self-esteem of a child and his academic achievement at the same time? One year, I came up with a bright idea. I told all my students, you were chosen to be in my class. Because I am the best teacher and you are the best students, they put us all together so we could show everybody else how to do it. One of the students said, really? <laughs> I said, really? We have to show the other classes how to do it. So when we walk down the hall, people will notice us. So you can't make noise, you just have to strut. 
And I gave him a saying to say, I am somebody. I was somebody when I came. I'll be a better somebody when I leave. I am powerful and I am strong. I deserve the education that I get here. I have things to do, people to impress and places to go. And they said, yeah. <laughs> you say it long enough, it starts to be a part of you. And so, I gave a quiz, 20 questions. Student missed 18. I put a plus two on this paper and a big smiley face. <laughs> he said, Miss Pearson, is this an F? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, then why'd you put a smiley face? I said, cause you on the roll. You got two right, you didn't miss them all. I said, and when we review this, won't you do better? He said, yes, ma'am, I can do better. You see, minus 18 sucks all the life out of you. Plus two said, I ain't all bad. <laughs> Four years, I watched my mother take the time at recess to review, go on home visits in the afternoon, buy combs and brushes and peanut butter and crackers to put in her desk drawer for kids that needed to eat and a washcloth and some soap for the kids who didn't smell so good. See, it's hard to teach kids who stink. <laughs> and kids can be cruel. And so she kept those things in her desk and years later, after she retired, I watched some of those same kids come through and say to her, you know, Miss Walker, you made a difference in my life. You made it work for me. You made me feel like I was somebody when I knew at the bottom I wasn't. And I want you to just see what I've become. And when my mama died two years ago at 92, there were so many former students at her funeral. It brought tears to my eyes, not because she was gone, but because she left a legacy of relationships that could never disappear. Can we stand to have more relationships? Absolutely. Will you like all your children? Of course not. <laughs> and you know your toughest kids are never absent. <laughs> never. You won't like them all, and, and, and the, the, the tough ones show up for a reason. It's the connection. It's the relationships. And while you won't like them all, the key is they can never, ever know it. So teachers become great actors and great actresses, and we come to work when we don't feel like it, and we listen to policy that doesn't make sense, and we teach anyway. <laughs> we teach anyway, because that's what we do. Teaching and learning should bring joy. How powerful would our world be if we had kids who, who were not afraid to take risks, who were not afraid to think, and who had a champion? Every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. Is this job tough? You betcha. Oh, God, you betcha. But it is not impossible. We can do this. We're educators. We're born to make a difference. Thank you so much. So good. <laughs> I talk too much. Um, but she is just talking about uh, all those things that you guys are already doing that we've talked about today. And she's saying just go in there and, and be their champion. She talks about, um, oh, I don't know, she's just entertaining to watch. She's fun to watch. That they have a little thing that they say every day. And she said she had a really tough class. And she's like, I decided. I went in and I told them. I said, you know, they put us all together on purpose. And then her students are like, well, they did. She said, yes, because you are the best students in the school. And I'm the best teacher. And they said, let's put them all together and see what they can do. She's like, and one of my little students was like, really? Uh, but she's very entertaining. She talks about how she has been a teacher for, for years and worked on that engagement and relationship piece. So be a champion. Look it up. But you guys have any questions for me? I went really fast. I encourage you to follow up. Um, Rebecca has my information if you guys ever have questions or want any resources, anything like that. I thank you for your attention and participation. I think I got you out of my heart.